Well, hello and a very warm welcome to today's podcast. Uh, this is Liverpool John Moore's Centre for Educational Research. And um, we're absolutely delighted that this will be the first podcast from the Centre for Educational Leadership, uh, where we are looking to develop a leadership live series. And I'm absolutely delighted that for this first episode, where we're going to be thinking about the importance of coaching for educational leaders, uh, to be joined by Vicky Briggs, who is the Director uh, of Education for the Challenge Academy Trust. So Vicky, thank you so much for joining us. Really delighted to have you here. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. I wonder if you'd perhaps be so kind just to tell us a little bit about uh, your role and particularly how perhaps in that role you support leaders across your trust. Okay, so my role is very varied. There are 13 academies in our trust, so they are ranging from primary, secondary and a college. Um, So as you can imagine, we're working with nursery children all the way up to post-16, so it's it's very varied. My role um, involves many, many things, um, from mentoring, from strategic overview of leadership and professional development. I lead on our Education Connect arm of the trust. Um, I work really closely with all leaders across the trust, not just our head teachers and principals, but also different senior leadership teams. But then also there's the operational side of our trust as well that I work closely with. So I develop the growth strategy with our CEO, um, Andy Moorcroft, but then also um, the day-to-day running of the trust as well, which is varied and and changes every single day, really. So it's a fascinating and interesting job, really. And no day is the same. Absolutely. <laughs> Sounds amazing. How long have you been in the role, Vicky? So officially, it's been just over a year now it wow. feels a lot longer I started off I was one of the founders of our trust and um, which was in 2017 so I was part of that initial growth of our trust we started off as a small trust with about there was five of us um, and I was leading out on the primary school improvement arm and then that has developed over time and um, I became executive I was a head uh, as well a, a teacher and then I was an executive head for um, about, what was it, 18 months, which was probably the hardest role mm. I've done because I didn't feel like I did anything. <laughs> I was head teacher one minute and then I was working with the trust the next. And then there becomes a, a bit of a crunch point where you can't do both, really. Mm. So that was the kind of transition then into the trust as we grew further um, and the change in leadership. I then became the director of education. So wow. the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> <laughs> so as you say, a really diverse role, but I'm sure really rewarding. Lots oh, of challenge, but Absolutely really rewarding. Yeah, I was, I was quite fearful moving from headship because the headship you're very in control of your school mm. and, and the strategic direction of that school and as a leader in a trust it's very very different in terms of how you influence and support and challenge others um, and serve others of course as well so when I moved from being a head teacher to the role I'm in now I was a bit fearful that I would be too um, almost distanced from from the children from the mm. young people that we serve uh, but that hasn't been at all the case if anything I'm more connected across the 10,000 pupils that we have instead of just a couple of hundred. <laughs> so my fear um, has not kind of been emulated at That's all. That's really, really interesting. Skills, yeah, yeah. I'm sure people listening to that will find that really interesting because it would be something they might presume. But yeah. actually, that level of being able to connect and, and you know, um, you know, there's some wonderful schools in your trust and you're doing some fantastic things. And 10,000... Students, yeah. that's incredible. But one of the things we're going to think about today together, um, and I know it's something that's, that's you know, very much at the heart of, of work that you've been leading and developing, is the, the notion of coaching, mm-hmm. and particularly the coaching of, of educational leaders. And just as a, a bit of an introduction, really, Jan Robertson in 2008 wrote a great book called Coaching Educational Leadership. And Jan's book is really around the idea of what's what's the purpose of coaching an educational leader, the idea of, of how they might build their leadership capacity. It's a really good book. And Jan really sort of develops ideas about being self-critical mm-hmm. as a leader and taking kind of theoretical models and applying them to your own professional learning and your practice. And, and that great opportunity just to talk through things and perhaps co-construct ideas. So uh, there's quite a lot out in the field, really, of, of why coaching can be important. But From your perspective as a director of of education across a a large trust, what would you say, Vicky, is the impact of coaching for educational leaders, both perhaps professionally and personally, in their development? I think it's fast. That's a huge question (laughs) uh, to answer. Um, It's huge. I think sometimes our profession doesn't reflect enough. Mm. I think we're fast paced and we're on to the next thing. Um, And that's why, you know, I've welcomed certainly with the early career framework that huge investment in coaching in terms of the ITT, the initial teacher training that's coming, the changes that are happening there. There's that extra 20, I think it's 20 hours or something like that, additional, and that will be linked to coaching. So I think there's this, there's all this, there's a shift almost in that 
we've tried coaching and dabbled in it for years, but we've never quite got there. And I think um, that's one of the biggest challenges, really. In terms of professional development, I think it makes people much more self-aware, self-reflective, um, better communicators. Mm -hmm. I think it makes people pause and reflect and think about in terms of strategies that they've got you know, all going on in their heads. If you think about the role of a leader, there's so much happening on a day-to-day -day basis that um, you know you can you can be um, what is it master of no, what is the, what's the saying I'm trying to find? You, you can be... Um, oh, yeah, jack of all jack trades. Jack of all trades and, and master yeah. of none, yeah. you know, because you are flitting. And that, and I, by that way, then you're not you're not kind of taking a pause and reflecting enough, really, for me. Um, I think it also helps to to kind of foster that, that self-awareness, but that goal setting about what people want to mm. achieve. Because sometimes, you know, we talk about being strategic. Very often in our jobs, you, you get drawn into the operational, which is fine, and that has to happen. But actually, to, to enable you as a leader to develop and your you know the way you're working to also develop, you've got to step back and you've got to be able to reflect. And having a coach enables you to do that because mm. it allows that special, dedicated commitment of time to you know to enable that to happen. Really, um, it's something we've tried and we've influenced into our trust, and it's something we continue to because I don't think we're there yet. Um, I think there's still a big piece of work to be done, but we've tried really hard to bring co coaching. Into, into our leadership teams um, and using different models as well. So mm. we started a couple of years ago, obviously the MPQs encourage coaching um, and those that have taken part in MPQs have, have had that coaching. That's on a very much an individual basis rather mm -hmm. than a, a trust or a school academy basis. We introduced a couple of years ago the basic coaching model. So we trained, I think it was about 16 practitioners, including myself, to become trainers, trainees of, of um across the trust so that one hopefully then started to cascade down we introduced um, a professional growth model rather than have performance management we've got the professional growth okay. model too um so that kind of aligned with the coaching approach but again we've never quite i don't think got there with that because everybody has the best intentions to yes we're a coaching school but truly do they really commit that time and build it into their practice um, and build it into that kind of whole school evaluation and, and technique. Most recently, we've worked with yourselves, which has been a really successful, um, almost pilot, really, um, where we wanted to look at our, our deputy heads because we felt the reason we chose um, our deputy heads rather than our heads is we've got a whole group of people there that very often sometimes were undervalued or um, not given that same time but then these are also future head teachers mm -hmm. and we know in the profession we haven't necessarily got a big long line waiting at the door to become head teachers so we wanted to invest heavily in our in our deputy heads so we we ran a program around developing deputy head teachers different from an mpq program it's very personalized to our trust but alongside that what was really important to enable them to start to reflect um, in terms of the learning that they were getting from the training, we wanted coaching, and that's where kind of we brought yourselves in to, to work with our with our leaders to enable, enable them to to talk openly in a real secure environment um, without any threats. Um, to talk about you know their their next stage in leadership development. Wonderful. I mean, I know from the Centre of Educational Leadership's perspective, it's been an absolute privilege to work with those leaders. You know, wonderful group of colleagues, and it's really interesting to hear you talk about that sense of you know being committed to the process and and realizing that it, it's sort of incremental and you can keep building on the way that coaching is being used. And uh, would you say, I think it's interesting as well to reflect on, for those in leadership roles, we hear a lot, don't we, particularly in educational leadership, about those roles often being quite isolated or mm. people carrying a lot of responsibility on their own shoulders and the stresses and strains that come with that. And of course, there's an element of that of that, that is part of leadership, you know, have a lot of responsibility, a lot of accountability. But have you perhaps found that one of the good things about the coaching is that sense of connection? So that instead of people wrestling with a, a challenge on their yeah. own, they've got that opportunity. And, and what I guess Robertson would talk about co knowledge creation, you know, co creating mm -hmm. the ideas. Have you found that's been the case, that people have been able to open up and, and hopefully feel a bit more supported? Mm -hmm. I think it's two things it's connection, but also alignment as well with yes. one another, because they've got that trust, they've built up that trust, obviously, with, with their coach, but then in those action learning groups that, that are, you know, really part, part, quite new to me, actually, I didn't know much about them until we started working with yourselves, that's really enabled them to, to kind of come together. You know, we're a cross-phase trust, so we've got primary, secondary in the college, and as you know, your secondary background and primary background, very, very different, lots of similarities, but lots of differences, and sometimes we can be... 
um, well, how should I say, scared with one another sometimes. <laughs> it's like, what have you done with primary? What have you done with secondary? Yeah. What do you do with them? Um, so that's allowed that kind of alignment approach, but then also that, that kind of co-design and, and, and co-understanding, really, of the challenges that, that actually you face, whether, whether they're four or 14 mm-hmm. or going into 18, you know, as well, because um, they're very similar. Um, and it's that mutual respect then as well, which helps to grow your culture of your trust, which is so important to get that shared ethos and understanding of each other's roles. Um, and then to help people then, because as a, if you mm. understand things better, that's when you can offer some support, but also recognition of what people are doing. But then also, you know, actually I can help you because actually I've had something similar. So that creates that, that lovely culture that, that we all strive for across, mm. across our trust, certainly. I think that's brilliant, isn't it, to, to reflect on the way in which it's, about developing a culture mm-hmm. of leadership. I mean, what would you say might be some of the other kind of pros and cons maybe? So we've talked about some of the pros. What might be some of the challenges, I suppose? I can imagine listeners thinking, okay, well, you, you, know, you, you know, you and I are obviously saying, look, we think there's lots of advantage to coaching, but maybe there could be some challenge too. So particularly picking up on, on your really good point around leadership culture and, and the development of culture, what do you think some of the pros and maybe cons are of coaching as part of a planned professional mm-hmm. development program. So pros, we could list them. There's loads yeah. that we said: self-reflection, you know, evaluation, that shared alignment, communication, being more strategic. All of those things. There's a, there's a lovely yeah. long list, and mm. they'll probably come out more in our conversation. I think not wanted to go negative, but talking about the cons, um, time, mm. and that's also a, always a pressure, isn't it? And, and cost, resource, I suppose, resource management. I know certainly when we started. You know, the example I gave before around the basic coaching model that we started a couple of years ago, in you know, in terms of that plan, it looked brilliant and actually we had trainees and the idea was it would cascade down. But in truth, um, it probably wasn't managed tightly enough because we'd kind of left it for people to buy in. And I think sometimes if you really, really want to get that culture of coaching into into your kind of trust or your school or wherever you, your place you work, you've got to force it a little bit which kind of goes against coaching because the culture of coaching is you've got to be open and you want people to engage. But actually, initially, I think you've got to do a little bit of um, a gentle shove, yeah. if you like. And, yeah. and certainly we had to do that when we started our project. And, it, you know, um, I was really excited about it because it was something I was really passionate about getting into our trust. But the people that were um, initially wanting to be involved in some of our deputies were a bit reluctant mm-hmm. and reticent um, for different reasons. One, capacity. I've got a really busy day job. I've not got time to spend an hour talking to a coach and, and so on and so forth. So they did need a little bit of, of coercion, which is a risk. That can be a real con because yeah. then people, if people feel coerced into something, they're not going to necessarily be be open. But interestingly, like we've been talking about before, um, some of those people that were most reluctant actually got the most out of and still get the most out of the sessions that we've got in place with yourselves. Um, but but I think one of the cons is around that around the cost and that time, mm. and you've got to really um, plan it in. And for us to kind of carry on with this in terms of our project, it's it's really important. Yes, it's been a great success, but it's almost so what now because the risk is we just don't do anything else. That's so another it's that great point. Follow up and yeah. the follow up is it's like anything in school improvement. The follow up is really yeah. important, isn't it? So I think for us now, you know, when we reflect about where we go next with coaching in our in our trust it's kind of it's it's that follow-up approach Mm. and how we're going to ensure that it's sustainable and it does become part of the culture and not just an add-on or uh oh we did that last year and we've forgotten about it this year and that's really important i think those are two great points there in terms of you know an awareness so people listening i think if you know particularly if they themselves are trust leaders or the school leaders college leaders and and they're thinking about i'm sure it resonates with them you know Mm -hmm. the idea of the two key things genuine buy-in you mm-hmm. know how to overcome the reluctance and the reticence yeah. and and how to uh, to do that in a very genuine way and how to you know to, to use that persuasive yeah. uh, you know guidance or, or you know even to really say to somebody look you know I want you to be really brave having I mean, that kind of I, courageous I, conversation I picked up the phone and it, it went against the culture of almost saying you know this is a great opportunity <laughs> yeah. you know I sent a wonderful email with the, with the brochures and everything then I picked up the phone and said you need to do this which completely <laughs> <laughs> you know conflicts against it but actually I knew for that mm-hmm. those particular people it was really important for them and interestingly you know without breaking any confidence it was quite interesting to see in our trust the difference between the engagement from the primaries and the secondaries initially and that that completely changed as well but in terms of those that felt that they wanted to do it straight away and those that were less um 
I don't want to say engaged because they're committed and, and all of those things. It was just they didn't feel they had time, yeah. which again is a con and, uh, you know, uh, in terms of ensuring that people recognise that it's important for them and their own development. I think sometimes as public servants, we are very much... We feel guilty almost about investing ourselves. Yeah, Do I don't know if that's the public servant yeah, in us. Absolutely, I that's a know. great. I mean, that is a great point, and uh, I mean, it leads on to an, another question. I think uh, that I have. Um, so, uh, really, that is around the those who participate, the leaders who participate, really seeing the value and really getting mm. the sense of it, and. Um, Sort of to introduce this question, really, there was, a, there was a great article written in 2021 by Ben Gibbs, and he wrote it for the Chartered College. Mm-hmm. And what Ben talked about in his article was leaders really experiencing the advantages of coaching, so that they might have been very reticent. They might have had those very same phone conversations like you, like you described. But as they got into it, what his article said is, actually, they started to see what he called systemic impact. They could see that Mm -hmm. what they were changing in their own leadership was having a really powerful impact in their school or in their trust or or, or within their setting. And he argued that it was because they were really developing fresh perspectives. They started to be open to uh, honest change, to to really saying, I actually now understand the Mm -hmm. complexity of the system that I'm leading within. And instead of that being something that I'm trying to gloss over, I'm trying to embrace it, I'm trying to learn from others. So it's a great article, um, that, you know, again, that, uh, that listeners might want to, to explore. Um, so he wrote for, for impact in the Charter College. But I guess what it makes me think of with all that you've just described there is, you know, you, you did that, you, you made that decision as a leader to encourage or, or to, 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 to cajole even and say, look, I really think this will be great for you. And, you know, I know you might have a little Always bit of reticence. Or with a smile. <laughs> Lovely. Great, great. But I, I guess now that you've been through that process, what examples would you be able to share of how you feel that that coaching leadership in your trust, in your setting, has actually gone on to have on, on the system, you know, on on the culture of your schools, on the experience of the, the pupils and the, and the students in your trust, maybe even on teaching and learning. What, what would you say, do you know what, I, these are some of the examples of where I think I can really see it's been effective. I think it makes people better leaders, for starters. Um, you know, just, just reflecting on myself, as you were talking then, I was thinking, actually, you, you said about that, um, I think it's about that secure challenge of mm-hmm. yourself as well. Um, Certainly, when I got into the world of coaching and, and uh, experienced it myself, it was very, very early on. I think it might have been middle leadership, maybe, or at MPQH. And I was a bit, oh, what's this now? I'm not talking to this person, <laughs> and so on and so forth. But it's so surprising how very, very quickly, with a really good coach, you relax and you, you realise actually how much is going on in your head. And actually, not just what you think's in your head, but what's further behind <laughs> as well that, that comes out. So I do think it makes you be a better leader. And certainly the question you asked about the difference into our trust, I think our, it's interesting our deputy heads are actually talking about now, oh, our heads need this now. And they're, they're looking at, at headship and thinking, well, our heads can do it this way, which sometimes deputies will do that, but actually with a bit more of an informed judgment mm-hmm. because they have become more reflective. Um, I think certainly some examples within our trust are we we took the risk of making our deputies um, and vice principals work together across phase. And I was really passionate about that happening because I wanted them to recognise the strengths and challenges in each other and each other's roles. So I think that's enabled a better um, relationship between some of our deputies across phase. Not that there wasn't anything before, but necessarily now they've become closer because they've got common um, challenges or not, and when they haven't got common challenges, they've actually got that that greater, um, I suppose, curiosity about each other's roles as well. So Mm -hmm. I think that really helped across our trust personally. I think on an individual basis for some of our leaders, it it has made them um, more strategic in their thinking. Um, Certainly, you know, I don't want to break any confidences by naming any, any people, but some of our roles of the group that were together were very, very different. And there was one person who was going through quite a lot at the time in, in their, their particular role, but it made the, enabled them to step back a little bit Brilliant. when yeah. they could have easily, because of the issues that were happening within their own institution, they could have easily become really absorbed by that. So the coaching enabled them to kind of talk it through 
and see it in a bigger perspective and, and kind, of, kind of put it in its place it needed to be rather than be consumed by something. So that scale then can be taken away and, and carried on in their own, in their career, in their roles on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but I certainly think for our deputies, it's just made them, you know, more self-aware, but also aware of the trust priorities mm -hmm. as well. And where we're, what we're trying to do as a trust, because sometimes, you know, for deputies, they're not necessarily um, aware of what the trust is looking to do and what our, our shared object, objectives might be. So I think that's aligned mm -hmm. thinking a little bit more as well for us. You see, and that's wonderful. And I think, you know, you're, you're giving us a really lovely concrete example that backs up exactly what Ben Gibbs said. Mm -hmm. You know, he said it, it has systemic yeah. impact. And, and, and as you've said there, you see that across your trust. You see it in the individual leader, yeah. in the way that they've become more strategic, more self-reflective. But you see it in the way that those networks become really concrete and yeah. of real value and real purpose. And that, that systemic kind of impact, we've also, in, within our trust, I mean, I could talk about things that we do all, all day, <laughs> but um, within our trust, we've got, we have got hubs. So we have um, cross-phase hubs, and then we've got this kind of phase hubs, and they're linked to subjects or, or areas, for example. And that's enabled then the, where the influences come further, because then the deputies have been able to kind of cascade that together. And because they've done their action learning together, and they've shared in confidence, you know, I don't know what they talked about to this day, you know, um, but they've shared in confidence some of the, the kind of the, the challenges or the issues that they're facing. They've brought that then into a bit more strategic objective and focus into the hubs. So there's actually true change happening as mm -hmm. well on the on the ground as well, which is influencing hubs, which is then influencing wider teaching staff as absolutely. well, which is what we want to happen. Yeah, wonderful. That um, absolutely fantastic. And I guess probably uh, you know in terms of our, our conversation to now bring it together really by thinking about maybe the way that it, from your perspective this whole approach could be taken forward for our profession. So I guess I'm, I'm interested in, in what lessons you feel have been learned in terms of leadership coaching that we could actually take to the profession as a whole to move forward the way that we in our, in, in our country support educational leaders. What would you say perhaps are some of those golden lessons that, that could really support leaders in, in education? Um, not to feel guilty in investing in leaders. <laughs> For starters, that is, it's thing that's really, really important that we invest in our leaders. Um, and by invest, I, I, I mean, you know, the, obviously the money and the resource, but actually the time in our leaders and, and for leaders not to feel guilty of given, being given that time to, to reflect. I think that's really yeah. important. Um, I think one of the biggest learning things is, is, is actually building it in into kind of the practice. Mm -hmm. and, and that's still a challenge for us as we go forward into how that continues. Um, you know, how we how we make sure that that becomes genuinely part of our culture, I think, which is what I said before. Definitely. And um, that's definitely a challenge for us, really. Um, and then it's where we go next with it. So, you know, um, I want to do some work around our, with our heads, our heads. I want to do some work with our central team, our central trust team. But then also, uh, you know, support staff is so under-resourced and under-supported. Uh, you know, we don't necessarily put CPD, professional development, to, to those colleagues. And again, they're such a valuable kind of cog in the machine. I think it's looking wider at how, how coaching can be used across. So, you know, I said before, it's, I'm really, I really welcome the change in, in the teacher training approach yeah. with the increase in coaching so it becomes you know coming through because we're trying to almost do it the wrong way around aren't we whereas if they're coming through to the profession with that that kind of um habit that good mm. habit um already built into them that will just be their norm won't it yeah. you know you look at the early career teacher the, the early career framework and the teachers within that they're really used to coaching and instructional coaching in particular and that then has enabled that to be cascaded to the mentors. So your mentors then are now talking about instructional coaching and how that can um, change performances and, and practice. So then that then is kind of starting to almost ripple effect out, isn't it? Okay. So I think I think that's that will come through. But in the meantime, I think as as leaders, we've got to really make a concerted effort to build that into into our practice whilst that still is starting to filter kind of upwards, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Wonderful, Vicky. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed uh, it. Thank you really for having me. Really wonderful to, to, to be asked. Uh, well, your pleasure. And thank you for joining us. It was wonderful to listen to to you and your perspective and all of the wonderful work in your trust. Uh, but hopefully, again, giving giving those listening, uh, particularly uh, uh, educational leaders, the opportunity to think about the culture, mm -hmm. that intention, how coaching uh, can have the impact it does on an individual, but also across the system. 
But um, I love that. I love that way that you've then talked about the fact that you know we're responding to that culture shift. You mm -hmm. know, as the as new entrants to the profession come through, and they've been so benefited by by mm. coaching they'll think differently won't they absolutely i think yeah. that's going to be wonderful but i love that idea as well that there's a responsibility for leaders to ensure absolutely. that there is that commitment there is that investment the investment in people mm -hmm. to ensure that it that it it's built in intentionally and be bold about it as well right. yeah because if you're bold about it we're we're leading the way aren't we so if we're talking about it openly you know then people will hopefully follow Wonderful. Mm. Well, thank you so much. So uh, I, hope, uh, I hope people have enjoyed listening to that. Uh, Vicky Briggs, Director of Education from the Challenge Academy Trust. Thank you so much. Uh, so this is Martin Kerridge for the Centre of Educational Leadership. Thank you for listening. Uh, and we look forward to having you join us uh, very soon on our next episode of Leadership Live.